I am Allie Finney, and I am the beauty and fitness director at Well and Good. I'm moderating our conversation this afternoon, um, evening, morning, depending on where you're catching us from. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you would have asked us what the future of beauty would look like back in February, I think our answer would have been very different than what it is now. In every way possible, the past six months have shape-shifted the future of an industry that is worth $532 billion worldwide and reaches just about every household in the United States in some way or another. Beauty is such a staple of our day-to-day -day lives, in fact, that there's an economic phenomenon called the lipstick effect that dubs it as recession-proof. But given that we're not simply in facing a recession, but a recession on top of a global health pandemic, on top of a reckoning on race, on top of a coming of age of Gen Z, it's safe to say that the beauty industry is in no doubt is no doubt in for some changes in the years, months, and days to days ahead. What isn't at this point? As a quick recap, late last year in our trend roundup for 2020, Well and Good reported that the two biggest trends in the beauty world would be the rise in skincare and the continued thoughtfulness surrounding sustainability. And while these two pillars no doubt continue to drive the beauty industry forward, over the next 12 months, they will be accompanied by other important themes, such as a continued push for um, products to become more diverse and better serving of all, a return to drugstore staples that work um, due to a lack of disposable income for pricey products, and a focus on personal care with personal care products like hand sanitizers, mask knee solutions, another year, another um, beauty term that we have to learn, and beyond gaining more space in the market. There is clearly so much to dive into, and so I'm very excited to be here today with these three women to chat about all of this and much more. I'd like to quickly introduce our panelists. Heather Woolery Lloyd is a board certified dermatologist and the creator of Specific Beauty and a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Dr. Willery Lloyd's quest for cutting edge research on aging led her into the field of lifestyle medicine, a medical field that emphasizes evidence-based lifestyle interventions to improve overall health and wellness. As a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Dr. Willery Lloyd continues to expand her research on how lifestyle changes can treat and prevent many chronic diseases. She believes in beauty and wellness from the inside out. B. Shapiro is the founder of Ellis Brooklyn and a New York Times style section columnist. She founded the clean and sustainable fragrance line Ellis Brooklyn out of her experience testing perfumes for the Times and also when looking for safer options for luxury scents while she was pregnant with her daughter Ellis and living in Brooklyn. Originally from Taipei in Seattle, she is the author of Skin Deep, Women on Skincare, Makeup and Looking Their Best, a compilation of her best columns on beauty. And Sharon Shooter, who is the founder of OMA Beauty and Pull Up for Change, listed by Women's Wear Daily as one of the 50 most forward thinking executives shaping the future of the beauty industry. Nigerian born Sharon Shooter is a rebel with a cause and on a mission to go off the well beaten path to redefine the rules of inclusivity and diversity. As a founder and creative director of OMA Beauty, Shooter has taken a hands on approach to create a makeup range that is forward thinking, radical, and uncompromising. She draws inspiration from her Afro heritage and infuses it with fierce modernity to create a truly fresh aesthetic. In June 2020, Shooter launched a social media campaign called Pull Up for Change, which asks corporate brands to publicize statistics on the number of Black people in their workforce. Thank you all so much for being here today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I want to start off by just, just kind of telling you how the conversation will flow. So we'll be talking over the next 45 minutes or so, and we'll have some Q&A in the last 10 minutes of our session. So if you would like to ask a question, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window, and you can just type your questions there. We'll do our best to answer what we can in the time remaining. I also want to point your attention to the chat function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom window that you can all type into to share your comments, thoughts, and um, more throughout the panel as various topics come up. However, please keep it respectful. Anyone who shares hateful or harassing remarks will be removed by me. Um, guys, I'm so excited to kick off this, this um, conversation and we have a lot to talk about. Um, in so many ways, I think that this time has changed the beauty industry in sort of challenging ways, um, important ones, but challenging ways. And so I'd really like if each of you could walk me through the most positive change that's happened in the beauty industry and for beauty lovers um, in the past six to nine months. Well, I can start. I, I will tell you um, one of the biggest changes and it's really, really exciting for me as a dermatologist who specializes in skin of color 
is the increase in awareness and emphasis on diversity and inclusion in skincare and in beauty. So that trend was happening. There was definitely a trend happening, but um, the current events of this year kind of catapulted that to the forefront. And for someone who has been kind of doing this my whole life, it's really exciting to see the emphasis on, on diversity and inclusion and beauty. And did you ask also about the, what was that, your other question? Yeah, just would love for everyone to kind of speak on the most positive, the most positive okay, changes for beauty lovers um, that have come to market. So that was a, that's what it was for me. Yeah, Sharon, would you mind sharing? Yeah, I think for me, it's uh, pretty much, I wouldn't say over the last nine months, because over the last three months, the increased awareness and uh, recognition for Black-owned brands. You know, I think that has been incredible that the market are finally given the respect to Black-owned brands and, and uh, especially from a retailer perspective, to get that awareness, to stop pigeonholing Black-owned brands as ethnic brands and actually seeing them as uh, Black founders and Black brands as true innovators who are innovating and creating for everybody. And I think it's been a, it's been a huge challenge in the industry, just one, not taking black owned brands seriously, and then two, only pigeonholing and assuming that because you're black, your brain can only work in black spaces, which is ridiculous. Cosign, I think absolutely. B, would you mind sharing? Yeah, so obviously I think the diversity element has been so huge and I think that it's been such an interesting time because we mostly have all been stuck at home. And so I think one of the things that has really come out from that is like, I think self-care has taken on a whole new meaning. And I think before it was this like term that we like devised, almost feels like before it was like a devised term, right? Because then in the pandemic and these times, it's like, no, I really do need that bath. I really do need that Epsom salt. I really do need that CBD oil. And I I think that all these things you realize okay wow beauty is really truly can be tied to wellness in a super authentic way and I also think it's an interesting time to really consider your other senses like I've really like sat down and thought more about about like why am I baking so much like why do I care so much my home space is much more like decluttered um so I think these things have for me especially since working in perfume has rekindled my awareness of sense of just everyday stuff. Whereas before, of course, I cared about my sense of smell, but I was so focused on like product development, et cetera. And like, you know, these complex perfumes, whereas I do think the pandemic has forced us to really stop and like focus on like these everyday things that maybe, maybe sort of like bypassed us. Definitely. Um, we just did a big home package and, and there was a piece on home scent, which seems to be just skyrocketing right now as we all spend more time at home. I do think that to your point, the senses definitely become more at play and we kind of want to find ways to, to take care of ourselves. Um, and to your point, our entire homes are now wellness spaces. So yeah, <laughs> our survival spaces too. <laughs> definitely. So in in speaking about survival survival spaces, um, we are currently in the middle of a global health pandemic, which is obviously shaping the beauty industry. Um, Sharon, I mentioned briefly the lipstick effect, which was coined by Leonard Lauder back in 2001 um, to, to refer to the recession-proof beauty industry. I'm wondering, are we seeing that, that trend hold strong this time around? Are we sort of like seeing it play as, as strongly as we have in the past in um, a downturn? I Term needs to be coined because I think the context in there is back in the last recession, right? It was all about money. It was all about finances. That was the issue. People didn't have money. So you could still, you know, even, and that's the whole point that even women, when things are tough and there is no money, you will still find a way to care for yourself, right? You will still buy that lipstick because makeup is such an emotive thing. Is the own fashion doesn't do to you what makeup does for you. You're not, you know, you're not looking at yourself in the mirror as much as you're doing. You're not slapping on that red lipstick and snapping yourself out of depression, right? And that's the power of makeup. What we have right now is a new, new set of circumstances. We are in a global pandemic, which means everybody's at home. So even when you have no money, at least you're able to go and hang out with friends to distract yourself, go into your friend's house and you're looking for cheaper ways to entertain yourself. Now there is literally no way to entertain yourself other than staring at your TV and working off a screen like we're doing right now over, over screen. I mean, look at how much pat down I am. And if I was attending this event in real life, I would probably have a makeup artist who's gonna glam me and my hair is gonna be all done. So right now is the fact that there is a lack of vocation. That's the problem we have here. It's not just the lack of money. And yes, 
lack of money is also there, but it's compounded by a lack of occasion, lack of social interaction. It's like buying a dress. Who's buying a dress? Why are you wearing it to, right? But everybody's going to buy active wear right now because it's more time and, and more casual wear. So I think this is a different set of circumstances. And that's why the lipstick effect is not in full force. People wear masks, masks, ruins your whole makeup. Um, even when you, you even have an occasion or you're trying to leave the house, you still have that complexity that you're going to feel really yucky if you put on a mask and after putting a full, full face of makeup. So I think right now that's why the makeup category in particular is really struggling and it's really hard hit because there are just no occasions for people to go out and, and look glamorous. Um, and even when you have those occasions to go out, you're limited that you have to wear masks. Even the celebrities that did the Emmys, look at, look at all of them, right? So all of that is gone. And I think that the lipstick effect is not relevant for this moment in time. We have to find a different a different word and a, and a different reality. I think people are now... I think more what's happening is people are not caring for themselves um, in a really deep way. You know, makeup is sort of superficial. I think this period in time, and that's why we see skincare have such a rise and such a boost. Um, people can't get to the dermatologist. Professional services are, are not available and everybody's going to at-home services. So everybody now is caring for themselves at home. Everybody now has time to sort of think, process, look at your home space. Uh, look at what you're doing at home and really apply that care to yourself. So right now, it's not really the, the lipstick effect we're actually seeing is the care effect that we're actually seeing in, in, in action. Definitely. And as someone who's founded a makeup company, like what do you, where do you, where are you seeing interest, I guess? And where do you go from here? Yeah, I mean, there are several categories that are still working, like brows mascara, because even if people are zooming, they still want to, you know, get a basic frame of face, which brows and mascara actually do. But I think right now it's about really pivoting with the times. I think it's about really looking to the future as well and trying to properly forecast what's next, because this year is gone, is gone. There's not really much that you can do about it. It's about changing our infrastructure. Makeup has been heavily bricks and mortar because it's very experiential. There is no experiential at the moment. People don't even want to have those experiential moments because they're afraid of, of viruses, right? So right now, everything is coming back into more digital experiences, um, more value as well as people are, are driving more value. And a lot of people right now are buying for the future too, you know, because when they see a discount or promotion or whatever, they stop piling, not because they need it today, because they need it for the future, which also means we're going to have a problem when we get into 2021, because a lot of brands now are driving a lot of sales through promotion and people are stockpiling their homes so they have enough products for next year. So I think, you know, for me as a, a, a brand, that is active in, in color cosmetics, which is uh, 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 um, an industry that's hard hit. Personally, our business has been fine because we're still a very young business um, and, um, and people have loved the message that we stood for. So what we're seeing in the industry right now is a lot of switch and we're lucky that we're one of the indie brands that people are switching from mainstream brands into indie. Brands like Revlon and L'Oreal, they're not so lucky. A lot of the mainstream brands are down 60, 50%. Some of them in some months are down up to 80% and that's, that's a big problem. So I think... Um, um, as a beauty founder, this is a really good time to double down your purpose, double down on your values and recruit people. Because now the good thing is people might not be purchasing, but they're listening, right? People are finding yeah. their are finding yeah. their home. It's really important to use this time and recruit people into your tribe so that when that wallet comes back and it turns back on and they have the occasions, they're already in your tribe. If you look at a lot of brands that are winning, you've seen social following is jumping up. People are engaging more at a marketing level because they have more time, they have more headspace to process. Um, and I think this is where a lot of independent brands can really come in and be very nimble and grab customers, yeah. brands that don't have that same emotional connection and equity with the customers. Definitely. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and the care element, I think, is really interesting. And um, people people listening, people do definitely, they are like following what people's value systems are. And I think that that's definitely something that we're starting to see so much more of. Um, B, we saw, there was a recent Digiday article that said the skincare category had jumped like 317% on Google searches in Q2. Is that the product category that's winning? What, as a reporter, are you sort of seeing um, come out of this successfully? You talked about Baz earlier, just curious. Yeah, thoughts. so, I mean, definitely, if you look at the stats that you're seeing coming out from like the business sector, it's definitely skincare. Um, I, I, like, I, like Sharon said, I think makeup is getting hit really hard. Fragrance is actually not doing well either. So I think fragrance I read, it was like 20 or 30% down as a sector. So I think skincare has really gone into that care category, right? And I, I'd be curious to know, I mean, if we really broke it down though, like what, how much are people spending in skincare? I'd be curious to know, right? Because I feel like, I feel like a lot of people might be searching for that like 20, $30 skincare item now. 
Um, I don't know how many people are searching for that crazy $600 item. But, but yeah, I mean, I think from, I think that we will have a supply problem because what has been produced for this year has been produced. And I think that is why you see those markdowns because the production cycle sometimes, especially for these bigger companies is like, it's like a year ahead of already. So they already committed possibly. And so we will see still a lot of the products that might not be suitable for pandemic time still hitting the pipeline. And then eventually you'll see like a change and then we'll see what happens, you know? Oops, that was going to be one question that I ask um, in terms of what the future, what the future will hold for the beauty industry in the next like year or so. Like, do you think that we'll see an uptick in products um, or do you think that it will hold steady? What What's your call? I think for I, I think it is a better time for an indie brand than it is for a bigger brand. But even for an indie brand, I think we have to be careful about what sort of products we're committed to launching because I think especially today, like it seems really disingenuous to be releasing something that's that's not super passionate or has a real story or has a real purpose behind it, right? Like we're so busy, we're so stressed out. And can you imagine just getting like, okay, here we go, another lipstick line? You know, like it almost feels like tiresome, like there's so many other things that we should be looking at. So because of that, every single launch has to be that much better, that much more passionate, that much more. But because you already have, you know, you have to commit to production at least eight months in, in advance, you're gonna have all these launches come out and then what's gonna happen? You know, they're gonna have to go on sale. Like Sharon said, people might stockpile, but also the, the customer might get trained on just buying at discount. You know, there's also, there's all these things like, uh-oh, you know, like what's gonna happen um, that I don't think has actually panned out yet, right? Because it's been six like, months, it feels like forever, <laughs> but it actually hasn't been forever yet. So I, I think it'll be a really interesting holiday season especially in the U.S. where we have the election, the super fun election. <laughs> so um, I think that will definitely affect things. And, and I just think there's a lot of like, and I, I, have, I have, I'm friends with a lot of founders and we're all talking about how there's this sense in the market now and our e-com, et cetera. Everybody's kind of like holding steady. Like we gotta like dig our fingernails in and just be like, oh, I don't know what's gonna go on. Uh, whereas early in the pandemic, I do feel like people were stockpiling more because they're like, oh, well, this is going to pass. I just, I mean, I'm going to consume, consume, consume while I'm stuck here. I don't think that's the mood anymore. It does sort of seem like um, maybe things are going by way of less is more as of late, um, just in terms of, you know, some of the the trends that we sort of see as we're reporting out stories. Um, which I think dermatologists, Dr. Dr. Willard Lloyd would probably be quick to tell us is not so bad for skin. Yes, I mean, I'm a big fan of less is more. That is something that I've always preached to my patients because first of all, people are more likely to stick to a simple regimen. And also I work at a university and I do a lot of clinical trials and I always emphasize that effectiveness or efficacy is not determined by the price tag. So um, I love this trend. I definitely think we're seeing a trend where less is more and that people are recognizing that products that are affordable are also extremely effective. Dermatologists have known this for our entire careers, but I think that now consumers are kind of seeing, hey, you know, I may not have to spend $300 on a night cream. Like, you know, if you have that money, great. But if you don't, there are equivalents at a lower price point. Definitely. Um, I'm curious to talk just in digging into the, the field of dermatology a bit. Um, it seems like telehealth and telederm in particular have really taken off this year. And um, I'm curious if you think that this will really open up um, accessibility for the practice, which has really kind of notoriously been a bit exclusionary, I think we could all kind of agree on. Totally agree, yes. Um, this is, that's such a great point. So telemedicine has taken off in dermatology. Um, we're one of the few medical specialties that telehealth is really perfectly designed for, especially if we get high quality pictures in advance. Telehealth can't replace a full body skin check. It can't replace evaluating a suspicious mole because we do really kind of need to see that in real life. But for things like acne and rashes, 
hyperpigmentation, um, certain diseases, telemedicine is perfect for derm. We've definitely seen a huge transition. Most practices are now hybrid. I'm actually back in the clinic full time. As I mentioned, I do clinical research and I also see patients. So I currently am not doing telehealth, but I am planning to try and add that back in because there's a need. Now that patients know that that is an opportunity to see a dermatologist, you don't have to wait in a waiting room for an hour, you don't have to take a half day off from work, you don't have to drive through Miami traffic, you don't have to do any of that. You can literally do it you know, on a 10 minute break from your regular day. It's um, for many, many people, I've just been getting requests after requests, when are you gonna start telehealth? Um, I was full telemedicine for the first three months of the pandemic. And then when offices opened up, I went back into the office. But I would say most derms in their practices are doing a combination of both and at least having telehealth still available. And I think it's great for both sides, both for the derm and for the patient. The only issue for the derm is we do need high quality images because it's very hard to evaluate something on a grainy kind of screen. Definitely. And it does seem like with some of the laws that were passed during COVID, it makes um, people who are maybe in rural areas or in areas yes. in cities that don't have um, derms easier to access one, right? Yeah. And that was when teledermatology came to be, that's where it came. It actually originated in the army because people were out in all over the country in rural places or even overseas. And if someone had an unusual rash, uh, one of the biggest ways that it started to grow and actually at University of Miami where I work, we were doing telederm 20 years ago, I was a resident in 1999, you know, and, and we were doing it back then for people who had no access to a dermatologist. So they were seeing a primary care had an unusual rash. They send us the pictures and then we would give a plan to the to the physician. So that's how it originated. And I think it it's an, a tremendous opportunity and, you know, to circle back to underserved communities, that is another huge opportunity because we do know that in general, unfortunately, dermatology practices tend to be in high income areas. So, you know, there have been studies that have shown that, you know, you can find out like what's a low income area just by plotting the dermatologist and whatever's in the center, there's no derm there. That's the area that's a low income area. So those patients had no access, at least easy access to a derm. And now I think accessibility has become much more mainstream for all patients. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it it definitely does feel like it's going to be something that that allows care for all, and I think that that's that's really great, especially when you look at you know the derm deserts and things like that or around exactly. the country. So. Because dermatology is like you know it's not it's just like wellness. We were just talking about wellness and how people are embracing wellness, and I always say you know wellness is for everyone. It's not just for you know wealthy people in big houses. Like and the same thing is when it comes to dermatology, people sometimes perceive a dermatology visit to be something that you know only certain and people do, but really um, improving access is a huge, huge, huge thing for me. And I do think telemedicine does offer that and it bring it, bring dermatology to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so great. Um, I want to quickly pivot to touch on how beauty brands are, are responding to the growing calls for diversity, equity, and inclusion um, at every level beyond foundation ranges that, that um, contain 60 shades, though those things are certainly important and we need to push for them more. Um, so Sharon, you started Pull Up for Change and the hashtag Pull Up or Shut Up went wide, um, calling on brands to share their diversity breakdowns. I'm wondering if you can explain to our listeners today who might not yet be familiar what the initiative is and why there's so much work to be done within the makeup industry and beyond foundation ranges. Okay, so um, Pull Up for Change is a really grassroots call to action um, that really started, you know, for me, it, it's sort of uh, the, the catalyst to actually get into Pull Up for Change was the Black Lives Matter movement after George Floyd died. But really, I've been speaking about this for three years. Everybody has been talking about the lack of inclusivity in the beauty space from a product perspective, but I thought they're all looking at it from the wrong perspective and the wrong angle, right? Because the reason why the output looks like that is because the input is wrong. You know, these companies are not diverse. Most product development team don't even have any form of diversity. I mean, that's the second layer we need to get people to pull up with, right? So, so essentially for those who are not familiar with Pull Up or Shut Up, it was a call to action to corporates to release their diversity numbers. We know that, you know, not everything that can be measured can be changed, but when you measure something and you start looking at it seriously, it starts giving you, when you have that data and 
getting that benchmark, it starts giving you a pathway to actually start driving change. It also brings this information to the public, which means that the public can hold brands accountable because clearly they cannot hold themselves to account. And we've seen this even across multiple industries. I mean, remember tobacco industries fought the medical system that were saying people are literally dying, like this gives people cancer. And they said, no, you know, because we know that companies will always prioritize profits, even over human life um, in the case of the tobacco industry. So we know that's the case. That's the reason why they're policing everywhere. You know, that's the reason why they're unions to protect vulnerable workers. But we haven't implemented the same thing when it comes to Black unemployment, which has become at pandemic levels. It is a human rights issue. The economic inequality in this country is staggering. The average Black family has an income of $17,000. The average white family has an income of $171,000. That is 10x. Um, um, so you think about that. How can you even live on $17,000, let alone having that as an average? Which means there is a huge amount of population that are existing on less than that. We need to address this. We need to address this and how this connects to police brutality because you know people look at this and look at police brutality, but it's cause and effect. So when you look at the issue about Black unemployment around the world, it is, it is causing so many issues issues because of the economic disparity. And in the context of beauty is the reason why the products you're seeing out there look the way they look. So when you're screaming for more inclusivity in products, you're asking the wrong question. You should be asking about the makeup of these organizations because you cannot ask people to fix a problem they don't understand. I don't know what it feels like to be a white woman, right? I can only read and research at best. The only reason why I can innovate for white people is because I have white people around me, right? And my company, I employ white people. So if I came from my own bias and said, oh, white women have, they can tell me straight away, no, I've never in a white woman that has that. So imagine the reverse, when you're trying to innovate for a customer that you've never even interacted with, you know, other than you see them in the movie or you see them from a distance, right? How do you understand? So at best, all you can do is a panel study. You get four people together in a room, four black women, and ask them over a two hours uh, and time period, all the questions you need. How can you compare that to when you're sitting with somebody who I'm black, my mother's black, my sisters are black, you know, all. I can give you more, more insights than you will get off a six month research, right? And this is the challenge within this industry is an industry that in the back end is not inclusive, which is why we've had to drag the industry by the teeth to even create products that caters for an inclusive audience. So you think about it, if you have to beg a business to go get more money, think about this, that when you're saying create inclusive product, you're essentially begging a company to do what's their fundamental job, make money, right? And they're so adamant, yeah, I don't want to make that money. It's fine. Put it away. And the industry has had to be dragged through the mud to even get to the point where they're interested in making the money, right? And I think when Fenty came out, what it showed the industry was that it was commercially viable because there had been a myth for the longest time that the black shopper or the shopper of color did not have money. It was not worthwhile. It wasn't worth the effort. When Fenty launched, the dark shade sold that in Manhattan. They sold that in the Bronx. They sold that everywhere. And the industry for the first time were shook and it really stood back and were like, okay, the appetite is there. How can I go get the money? And ever since they've been getting it wrong. So I think where pull up for change comes in is really advocating in terms of, you know, firstly, this is a human rights crisis, but secondly, diversity is good for business. That's why it makes no sense. There has been research done, Bain did a research about four years ago, and the data showed that companies with more diverse teams outperform ones without diverse teams by 19%. So the commercial argument is there. It's that if you have diverse teams, you will make better products. You will make products that are representative of the world that we live in, right? And this is not about dragging people. This is actually about helping businesses be better and be stronger. And I think um, that's why we started this movement and put it out to the consumer because there is so much a consumer doesn't know. And even right now, we're still being tamed in telling them a lot of things because some things they can't even handle. They can't, if they know the amount of quote unquote inclusive brands that don't even have, you know, that are making for black people, they have never tested those products on black skin, they will be flabbergasted, you know, in terms of the kind of half assed and half baked effort that it comes to, you know, people now want the dollar, but they don't want to go in there. And I think what's beautiful is time after time, again, the black community have proven the world wrong. If you remember in the nineties where rappers started wearing um, on luxury brands, the luxury brands, the designers would write to stylists and write to the rappers and say, do not wear my brand. Can you believe that? Do not wear my brand, take it down. And um, they, they, even though these rappers were buying this product, nobody was styling them at the time. They were going out there buying Gucci, buy, and the designers were saying, don't wear my product, you're cheapening it. This is not the image I want. And they were adamant the urban consumer was 
not a viable consumer. How wrong were they? Fast forward to 2020, Louis Vuitton are gathering Virgin Abloh to go become the head designer. Balenciaga has essentially converted into a streetwear brand. Almost all the main brands now are trying to tap into that urban, that street vibe because it was extremely viable. Look at the same thing happened in entertainment, right? Entertainment. MTV refused to play black music. You, they would not play your music just because you were black. Michael Jackson was one of the first people and even black artists like MC Hammer when hip hop was trying to go into MTV had to do gospel hip hop essentially. Like, you know, we gotta pray. I mean, like, yo, what is that, right? Fast forward to now, what is the biggest genre of music? Hip hop, not rock and roll, right? So every single time the black consumer has proven the market wrong. And this is another time again. So I think we're really seeing a seismic shift. We've seen a moment again in time because once again, the beauty industry are always so slow to actually catch on to that. What's powerful about the black consumer it's not just about their spending power, but because they drive culture and they drive trend. And that's what fashion discovered and that's what music discovered, right? And that's why it's so pivotal. I mean, Tri Travis Scott, everybody now is getting a deal, right? Everybody is pivoting on rappers like nobody's business. And this is where I think the beauty has missed the mark. And, and that's why this moment is so important. But for me, I didn't want them to just focus like those industries that instead focus on exploiting the Black community in terms of using Black faces, but not giving, you know, not paying them properly, not giving them a seat on the table. Look at entertainment where Black artists drive the whole industry but where are the black executives where are the black people in boardrooms in, in in this company same with fashion adidas nike profit so much from black culture and black people where are the people where's the diversity 77 percent of their numbers are white right 77 percent way above the national average of white people uh, um, in america so this is the real focus to make sure that in beauty we don't do the same thing and the pull up for change extends beyond beauty i mean we've called out nike we've called out a lot of those brands to make sure that for the brands who are already profiting of black people you are giving us a seat on the table. We cannot continue to buy where we cannot be hired. And that's the whole point. So we must be hired. Capitalism has to go full circle. And that's the objective of our campaign. It's amazing. I think it's so amazing what you've done and um, just really the accountability because it does need to change and so much needs to, to progress and get better. So absolutely agree. And I'm so glad that it's something that you, a movement that you started. Um, B, I'm curious as a as a reporter um, for such a long time, you've you've reported on beauty. In what ways do you think the market still needs to really push forward? Oh my gosh, so many ways, right? I think that you know, I, I did Sharon. I actually wrote a story about um, when the Fenty Forty Colors came out, and then every single other beauty brand decided they need to put out Forty Colors, right? And some of the Forty Colors were like still all in the medium shade range. I mean, it was like it was a hot mess. You know, everybody was like, oh, I got to go do that. 40 became the new standard, but the 40 was like a, a gazillion random colors. It wasn't even in the deep range. It was like just all over. Maybe it was like 10, you know, fair colors now suddenly. But um, but I think, I think, A, I think the diversity issue is really, really complex because so in fragrance, for example, there's almost no diverse perfumers. We are making a new scent next year with an Asian perfumer. He is, I and I, I think he might be the only or one of the only Asian master perfumers like available. So it, it's not a surface thing. It's really deep and really systemic to the point where like, I think we need to even look at education, right? Like we need to get more Latina, more black, more, uh, just more candidates and more ability to source from these pools of talent. Because I think, especially as an indie brand, you see that too. It's like, okay, you want to hire somebody that's great and talented and all these different things. And if it's diverse, great, you know, all of that's super important, but then you end up fighting with, you know, the big, huge companies, the corporations of the world for this talent. And in fact, what we need to do is bolster these people, these young candidates from the very beginning. And I think that goes back to the fact that, you know, if you look at FIT's master marketing program, we need to boost diversity in that because that's actually where a lot of beauty companies hire from. Like if it's in fragrance, it's overwhelming European Caucasian men, right? So from every level, from perfume to creative to marketing, there's more women now, but like just, you know, it's, it's actually quite shocking. So I think that, I think that on the one hand, yeah, 40 colors, amazing. I'm happy for it, right? That's one more step. I don't want to like knock brands for not trying, but I think that there's so much more that we can do and so much more that we can continue doing and to not have this conversation be a blip. 
because um, in that story I wrote from the New York Times, I talked about how, I don't know if you guys remember, but when like the early models got signed, it was such a big deal, right? Like the Naomi Campbells, the Imans, there's been these blips of diversity, right? Like, ooh, you know, so-and-so is gonna be a Revlon model now, let's do a diverse color collection around her. And then where are those products now? So that's what I don't want, is I don't want this to be a trend, right? Because it's not a trend. It's, it's, there is all the, these, you know, amazing studies that do show that yes, you're right, diverse, diversity is, is not just a trend, but in fact is integral to, an, to a successful company today. So I think those are the things that we really have to be aware of. And also the other thing that I feel like, um, because I, I do spend so much of my life on social media now, before, but definitely more during COVID, I think that one thing that something something needs to change about the tone of social media today. And I say that as a person who's watched social media and beauty from the very beginning. So I have a funny story. So I started covering social media backstage for Fashion Week. I might have been the first reporter to do this before even Instagram existed. I covered for the New York Times shooting grainy photos on Twitter and on Vine. Vine, which doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> and I remember in the early days, social media being really positive and really about authenticity and really about um, this new way to look at beauty, this refreshing way. And I think that, you know, all these movements that we see happening on, on be in beauty, whether it's on social media and real life, et cetera, I think that we have to be really careful and make sure that it's positive change that we're pushing through. Make sure it's not just like we're being bad cop and yelling at people and calling out Britons. You know, I see that so much on social media now. And I'm like, yes, it is important to call people out, but it's also important to support them and be like, okay, this sucks. You know, you guys shouldn't be doing it this way, but like, let's move that forward and keep it positive. I'm seeing so much negativity. And I think that is also an outpouring of people being frustrated, you know, at home and like, or whether or not, you know, their, their own like, COVID situation or personal situation, whatever it is, it's just this outpouring of negativity. I, I just really wish we could kind of like reel it back to that original like spirit of social media as being this place to share, as this place to not be so filtered, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Dr. Lloyd, the medical field has to contend with this in just a huge way. I'm curious how you think, um, the dermatology can can do this better, can, can diversify and really um, serve all skin tones better? Well, first of all, I have to say this is such an amazing conversation and um, everyone has made such great points. So I'll say, I, I'm gonna talk on about social media for 30 seconds only because B brought up something that I'm so passionate about because I do think social media can become this very negative space. I think that's one of the reasons why TikTok took off this year because TikTok to an extent has has a very positive vibe. <laughs> and it's like, it, it reminds me of, of Instagram a long time ago where you would go on and it wasn't a stressful experience. Now I feel like sometimes with social media, it's like, it's so stressful and not helpful for our mental health. <laughs> so um, so I, I totally agree with you, B, on that. I just had to say that. Um, for someone who believes really in wellness, that whole well, full being wellness, I think we have to be really, really careful on how social media has changed. But from a diversity standpoint, as a physician, um, things have gotten better, but there's lots and lots of room for improvement. So dermatology is the specialty that has the least representation of any specialty. So 3% of dermatologists are Black, 4% are Hispanic, which is way below the national percentages of Black and Hispanic patients or Latinx, um, Latinx doc, uh, people. So, um, so we have a lot of room for improvement in dermatology. We are the most competitive specialty to get into. I always say getting into dermatology is like the amazing race. I mean, you have to publish papers and work with famous people and get awesome letters and volunteer and, you know, you know, and find a cure, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's like, you know, those applicants are stellar, stellar applicants and it's a really competitive field. And I think a lot of medical students who are persons of color sometimes feel discouraged or think maybe I can't get in. So 
So we are actively trying to change that. I am a member of the Skin of Color Society, which is a society that is based on promoting mentorship and exposing young students, even to the, I have students contact me in high school. I'm not kidding. Like I have high school students to say, I wanna be a dermatologist. I just did a panel a few nights ago for the University of Miami, which were undergrad students who wanted to do dermatology. And the panel was, you know, what can, what do I need to do to get into dermatology? Imagine being 19 years old and trying to strategize how to become a dermatologist. So, um, so I think that it, that will change and it's become a priority for the um, American Academy of Dermatology and dermatology uh, chair people, you know, all the chairmen around the country to really improve diversity because we are the last specialty. No one is lower than us in diversity, um, but we're working on it. So the great thing is that we have the Skin of Color Society, which is a great resource for people who are interested in pursuing dermatology and gives mentorship opportunities and opportunities to write papers and do all the things you need to do to get in. And um, a lot of good work is being done. So I always like to end on a good Point and you know we're and it's growing and I do think again this year has has this has become crystal clear and and now programs and program directors and chair people are really focused on improving diversity in their programs so I think in the next ten years we'll see more diverse dermatologists but right now we're you know a, a tiny little pack of people. <laughs> No, and I hope that that holds true for literature, et cetera, as, as all derms are being trained so that people just get the best care possible. Um, right. That I'll just say, I know, I know you want to say, I want to say one other thing is that the other thing, the other issue was that we didn't have representation in our textbooks. So you would look at it, you know, you're learning dermatologists, you want to treat all patients, but you never saw patients pictures of black skin. So you never saw, or darker skin, what we call skin of color, which is skin types four through six. So um, that is also something that we have to do a lot of work on that has not changed at all in 20 years. I just reviewed a study and they counted the number of darker skin type pictures in a textbook from 20 years ago and a textbook today, and it had not changed at all. It was exactly the same. So, um, but you know, that study was published. So hopefully in the future, it will change. This is why the importance, like Sharon mentioned, the importance of research is so important because when you have the numbers, you can create change. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I just want to be mindful of time, so I'm going to, to push us forward to what I really feel like is the, the kind of third pillar of what has shaped the past six months, and it's a coming of age of Gen Z, which um, it really feels like this is the first year that we're really feeling that in the market. Maybe as a brand owner, I'm, I'm a few years behind, um, but as a reporter, I definitely am starting to see their, their stronghold. Um, so from Hiram selling out on Sarah, CeraVe on TikTok um, to Instagrams with, the, with hashtag ad falling 37% year over year. I wonder if many of the themes we're touching on um, are also influenced by new consumers who buy with a purpose and a conscience and who care about the environment and who aren't looking for a shelfie when three products that cost 30 bucks will do. So can each of you tell me quickly just the, the ways you're seeing the market shift thanked, thanks to Gen Z's um, influence, Sharon, we can start with you. Yeah, I think, you know, Gen Z are an incredible generation. I think they're the first generation to truly put their money where the values are. And that's why we're seeing change. I mean, look at the beauty industry and cruelty-free. That was not even a thing. Like, you know, it was all Peter and crazy people, loving animals, go hug a tree, right? And now every brand is cruelty-free. It's become, why did that happen? Because of money, right? That's why I keep telling people, if you want to impact any change at a corporate level, the corporate control, corporates only respect one thing, and that's the dollar. And if you can threaten that or take that away, they will make the change expeditiously. And that's what Gen Z have been able to use as a very effective tool because they are putting their money where the values are. They are not respecting the values of their parents, which was more about affirmation, which is more about, I'm going to buy a, a go, go get a $300,000 country club membership. I need to go buy the most expensive dresses to make, make me belong. Gen Z have come up with a complete different strategy because they go like, no, they have a stronger sense of identity. But at the same time, selling to Gen Z, one must be mindful that there is a big conflict in Gen Z. There is also a conflict between who they want to be versus who they truly are, because this is also the same people who are having surgery at the rates that we've never seen before, yet they're the same people who are talking a lot about identity and individuality. So there is a bit of a conflict, and I think it's because they're the first generation that are digitally native, right? And that's the conflict of social media, and when you're in digital, people are now having multiple personalities and split personalities, and are shopping for two personalities. So you can't even, you know, before we could classify people by age type and judge how they behave, you can't even do that anymore. So that's why I go like Gen Z are very conflicted kind of generation. 
generation that the good part of Gen Z is that they are putting their, their, their money where the values are. And the reason is because they've collectively said, that's what we're doing, right? We're all individuals. We don't follow the pack yet. They follow the pack even in doing that, but it's great. And I think that continue. And I think the also flip side and the danger of Gen Z is because they've been born into this digital world and social media, which is the second advocacy that I have that, you know, there is an age you have to get to before you drink alcohol. There's an age you get to before you're allowed to gamble, right? But with social media, there is no age limitation. And it's more addictive than any of those two things that I just talked about. And that I think that other conflict is a result of social media, because there's the social pressure, there's the, you know, to want to be, I mean, the most um, the, in the and surgery right now is called the Snapchat uh, um, surgery, where people are young people are having surgery to make themselves look like the Snapchat filter. So I think the Gen Z are an incredible generation. They are the generation that are really going to deliver change because they're highly motivated. Activism is cool. It's not you know being being a troublemaker. It's actually trendy, right? And and so I think we have to take the good good from it. We also like everything in life. There's always two sides of the coin, and we also have to be mindful of the other side, especially as brands and having that responsibility on how we market to these people because they are not immune to marketing even though a lot of people try oh they, they see through it they do but they're also still young right and so and so in being responsible in being careful but i love gen z because they are going to change the world definitely um yeah and just to, to a note on social media like i do think that to your point there are ways that we can keep it in check but there are also ways like i I look at what you've done with social media and I really just think that there is so much power and so much um, progress that we've made too. So definitely two sides to the coin, but it's a, a tool for change, certainly. Exactly. And that's why I go, I think one of the things that with social media that people don't realize or people with life in general, I think if we follow Newton's second law of physics, for every reaction, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So for every good that social brings, think about there's an equal an opposite reaction, which is the depression, the surgeries, you know, the rise of, you know, false information and misinformation. And it's very important everybody balances those two. So I love social media. I don't think it's really like a lot of people talk about it. It's, just, it's about use, right? But we have to be mindful of both sides. And that's why I talk about, you know, even the need for age limitation on it. So that people are mature enough to be able to balance that. I don't have a problem with my social media use. I go a month without logging in. It's not addictive for me. But if I was a 10 year old kid and I was over Organic. I mean, I adopted social media. It wasn't part of my life, so I can control it. If I was a technical kid, I probably can't control yeah. it. And that's not that we need to do that. They're too equal, and it's an equal side. The good is as, is as strong as the bad, and we just have to balance them out. Definitely. And something I think when you talk about extremes, I think like we've definitely been in a world in which um, the shelfie has really reigned supreme. Like there's no higher currency than having um, a really stocked beauty cabinet. But I'm curious, um, B and, and Dr. Lloyd, if you can talk a little bit about um, how sustainability is really coming into play lately um, in, the, in the market. Um, sure, I'll go first. So with Ellis Brooklyn, when I first started the company, I was pregnant with Ellis, um, my first daughter, I was living in Brooklyn. So actually my first priority was that it was safe because I was pregnant, you know? And of course, you know, the environment stuff in the very beginning for me, I was like, okay, as we started making choices, you know, you, you create the box and then you're like, okay, well, do you want this regular stock or do you want this, you know, recycled, responsibly grown paper stock? And so as things started going, I started choosing these things. And I chose these things because I grew up, um, I, was, I was an immigrant. I grew up with not a lot of means. And for me, I grew up in the Seattle area. And so I always hiked, um after school like in the woods down the street so for me nature was like this very healing place so i felt like okay this is like i'm a founder brand i can make this brand about me and so uh, as i made these choices i was like yes i'm gonna pick the responsibly sourced forest paper you know and so as we started making these choices along the way our brand became sustainable and that sustainable term is a moving goal post i don't i think I think it's really tricky to be like, okay, my brand is 100% sustainable. No, because there's always something more you could do. So that's something that's become very important to us um, from the beginning. And, and it was really sort of the growth story of how we, 
you know, chose to make these uh, choices in Alice Brooklyn. But as we move forward in clean beauty, I think that the sourcing of materials is going to be really important. And I think that is something that Gen Z, interestingly, actually has influenced more and more, right? I think that if you really look at millennials, whatever you want to call, I'm actually technically a millennial, if you can believe I'm like the last year of millennial. I was like, I don't even look like a millennial. That doesn't make sense. Um, but, but I think that it was very much about, I, I read a really interesting story in Bloomberg Business Week yesterday about the blanding effect. Do you have, do you guys know this at all? No. Oh, it's about, it's like literally, it's a hilarious article for those who are listening. Literally go read this afterwards. It's a great article and it's a little sad, it's a little bit satire, but you literally, it's like, how do you create a brand according to millennials? And it was like, you know, make sure your font is not too fancy, say, you know, like, font. <laughs> no serif font. <laughs> make sure you throw some blush pink in there. It was, it was a hilarious article and it was called the blanding generation or something, right? Um, for all of that, you know, you, you look at millennials, I think, it's one era. And then you look at Gen Z and you're like, wow, no, that's actually not just an age group. It's actually reflecting the time now, right? Mm -hmm. I'm 39. If I'm going shopping, I care a lot more about price point now, right? Maybe I didn't 10 years ago because the situation in life and stuff is different. So I think when you think about Gen Z, you can also think about like, what is the current circumstances right now we're facing? And yeah, I don't feel like using 10 products anymore, but I did maybe three years ago, you know, like back when like that K-beauty thing was super sure. hot, I was definitely, I was definitely buying. I was like, yeah, I need that <laughs> yeah. nine items for glass skin, you know, not anymore. I think I might use two to three products. And I think that's just like, I think there's one thing to say, okay, Gen Z is like that, but I think it's another thing to be like, let's look at society and what's going on. And that's yeah. also part of it, you know? Yeah, so it's I think definitely a reflection, it feels yeah. like of, of the times and of kind of where we are and what, what's happening and what's going on. So I do take that point and definitely think that it's true for, for all. Um, so that we get to a few, a few questions, I will ask my last question. Sorry to cut you off, B. Um, I no, no, no. I just, I very much like have want to get, um, to this forward looking question, which is in a few words, could you tell me what we have to expect in 2021 from the beauty industry? And then we'll open it up to our, pan our, um, participants. Who wants to go first? Oh, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think for 2021, I think we're really going to see, especially indie brands, I think, come out with really amazing products. I say that because I can feel, you know, speaking to other indie founders, I can feel like when you're releasing something now, it better be good because it is a scary time out there for all businesses. And if you're gonna release something, it's gotta come from in here. It's gotta come from somewhere where you're like, I have to release this. Whereas maybe before, you know, talking, you're talking to your retailers, you're like, okay, well, I need to fill out my assortment. You know, I need to like have a couple of extra products here. I don't think people are doing that anymore. I think it's like every product you see is gonna be like a lot of oomph, at least the good indie brands, I think. Yeah, I love that. Um, less is more and kind of keeping with that mindset that we were just talking about. Um, Dr. Willary Lloyd, would you mind sharing? Sure. I think that um, the two biggest trends I think that are going to happen is one is AI, artificial intelligence, and that tech aspect in beauty. So I'm seeing it now. One of my good friends actually just launched an app that helps dermatologists um, do dilutions for toxins because every toxin has different dilutions. So it's an app that you can quickly look it up and pick the dilution that you want. So I think apps and beauty are going to become bigger. They, they've started, I actually gave a lecture on apps and beauty in February when I was able to go to Paris and um, now I can't travel, but it was like really hard to do that talk because I had to do a lot of research. And I bet you, if I give that talk a year from now, it'll be dozens and dozens and dozens of apps. The other trend, which we haven't touched on, but I think is a big trend and very popular with Gen Z is this whole unboxing experience. I think since people are at home and getting the product through the mail is the shopping experience. I've seen this huge trend of unboxing being this you know, experiential event and a little piece of joy that you can get at home, that at home shopping experience. So um, sustainability, I think is a huge trend, but I think that that combined with, if you can do that and have the person have a wonderful unboxing experience, that is um, something that I think will grow next year. Such an interesting um, observation that, that really that is kind of the shopping experience now for sure. Um, Sharon, would you mind sharing? 
I think for color cosmetics, and I can, I'm speaking specifically about makeup and color cosmetics, we're actually going to see the opposite. I think we're going to see people returning to bricks and mortar. I think people are going to return. And once the world opens back up next year, it's going to be one year of people locked in and just not being able to socialize. I think there's going to be a complete revolution in terms of people just wanting to be out there. People wanting to like be like all the things they've missed over the last year. People are going to want to touch and feel. I see color um, making a strong comeback because like the mood is rebellious. I see people expressing that on their faces. Um, I do see that they're going to have a simpler lifestyle at the same time. And that's the dichotomy that we're going to have to uh, uh, reckon with next year. Um, I think color cosmetics is really going to struggle despite people thinking it's going to come back for many reasons. I mean, the entrance of celebrities is, is going to decimate the category, same as it did fragrances. And because uh, right now there's a huge celebrity cash grab and every man in his, on this planet who has a face is releasing a makeup brand because the barrier to entry in makeup have now become so low and there is so much investment being pumped now retailers are only reserving their space so i think unfortunately in skincare whereas innovation will be a key in 2021 i think innovation is really going to lack in in that this space because the true innovators are just not going to get the breeding space and also the voice because it's going to be hard fought and like i said retailers right now are only back in celebrity brands investors are only back in celebrity brands because of the quick win and as such is it will decimate the category and it's going to take some time to come out of there so so unfortunately, I don't see for makeup um, in 2021, a lot of, you know, like um, excitement as in skincare. I mean, skincare is flying, doing really well right now. And for the first time in America, skincare is a bigger category than color cosmetics. It's never happened before. Um, so I see that uh, color cosmetics has some real big challenges coming in front of us. One driven by celebrities, which is going to drive a lack of innovation because all the celebrity brands are churning the exact same thing and just repackaging them in, the, in different packaging. So that's going to bring a lot of problem um, into the industry. We're going to see the um, customers want to return back to experience. What we're also going to see is a flip in. Um, I, I, I feel like, um, and we're already seeing that at the moment, um, people are going to be more regional than they've been global, which means that a lot of flagship locations are going to struggle and a lot of like more regional at home as people want to be with community are actually going to flourish and people not wanting to go as far. So I think travel is going to have a problem where people are now just used to not traveling as far. I don't think that habit is going to break. So I think even retail, a lot of store classifications are going to shift because you're going to see people going more to their local stores than doing that massive trip just to get to that big flagship store. And as such, retailers will respond by renovating and making those local stores more homely so that people can come, they congregate and congregate with friends. So uh, my insights are completely different, but that's really what I see for my Yeah, no, that's interesting. And it probably gives many indie brands like an advantage um, that have been like in local shops for, for years and years. So definitely hear that. Every brand gives, give indie brands space to, to, to breathe, yeah. but uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have time for probably one or two questions, so I'll quickly um, quickly get to them. Um, Rachel wants to know, after taking the first step of recruiting and hiring non-white employees, do you have any tips on how to build a company culture that will foster the newly introduced diversity? Sharon, I'll kick that over to you. Yes, I do think the first thing, like look for recruiting people because people don't understand the damage it does when you, and this is why I have a lot of companies coming to me right now. Go, oh, I apply, I put my role out there, no black persons apply. And I'm like, why would they? I was working in corporate, I left like many black people who are entrepreneurs right now because the cultures are really toxic. So I think the first step, because recruiting and that mad rush to recruit really just helps to tick the box so that the data looks better, right? It does nothing for retention. It does nothing for really fostering that culture that is a place that people don't understand the amount of microaggressions that Black people face in the in companies, the lack of mentorship, the lack of sponsorship. We know that 77% of leaders would pick a successor of their race and gender, which is why it was even a struggle for women to actually progress within corporations. So I think that the where it actually starts is looking at that culture. Um, firstly, take your HR handbook and everything and flip it all over, start it all over again. Everybody's copied and pasted the same HR handbook for, for the last 20 years. We need to look at it because there's a lot of practices there that are extremely discriminatory. We need to look at creating forums where people can speak freely. And most importantly, we need a culture that is a shared culture. 
the problem with corporate culture, same as 10 years ago, 15 years ago, corporate culture was a boys culture. Now corporate culture is a white culture. Um, it is not a shared culture. It needs to be a shared culture. It needs to not be defined. Every company, oh, this is my company culture. And I, when I tell them outline what it is, immediately I'm like, oh, the capacity of that culture, it is a very white culture. So I think brands need to start, or companies really need to start looking at themselves. I would say the first step of what to do is look at leadership. Everybody tries to start at the bottom, no, start at the top. Everybody sort of feels like their CEO is immune to racial bias. That's bullshit. Everybody has biases. So I think it starts from the leadership team, firstly identifying their own biases, and how it impacts the company starting to fix that. Um, starting to bring strong leaders of color into that leadership team and not by recruiting from outside because that's lazy, right? It's very lazy, especially when you have people there. You want people, other people have already groomed. Why would they come to you? So groom your own talent, bring people to the top, uplift them, elevate them, and let them speak. Don't give them a ceremonial seat, chief diversity officer. Give them a real seat that matters and um, empower them to actually speak up. And through that, you will start getting the answers because the answer for every company is very different. And I know everybody's wanting somebody to just give them a handbook so they can look at. I think why one of the reasons why this is such a big problem for companies is most problems they can throw money at. This is a problem that cannot be fixed by money, no matter how much money you have. It has to be fixed by firstly, everybody checking their biases, understanding the impact of those biases, listening to other people, from the leadership level and then start rolling that into the organizational culture. Essentially, if you answer this question, how do I want to be treated? Black people are human beings. We're not a different species. We didn't fall off the uh, off a spacecraft and just came down here that everybody's trying to understand. I am exactly like you. I want to be respected in the same way you want to be respected. So just thinking about that and putting that in the forefront, what are the current courtesy? You know, when I was in corporate, oh, you can't wear braids. If I told you as a white woman, you can't have your hair blonde, it would be offensive to you, right? So it's the same thing. There is no difference in that or oh my god your food stinks if you are eating and i walked up to you and said to you, your food stinks you'll be offended by that so it's it, it's not complicated it's just treat the next person the way you want to be treated you want to be fostered you want to be recognized you want to do something and people say you've done a good job and people not overlook you because of the color of your skin you know so all of these things is not really complicated to be honest and that's why i go start with the culture start with building even though it doesn't give you a quick win so that you can post a report tomorrow and go i have more black people but create that because then in the phase two when you start recruiting firstly people will come because they can see the change and when they come they're going to stay and that's the critical part of it i couldn't agree more um and i think that is an excellent place to um end our talk today though i wish we had many many more hours because you guys are um fascinating and this is just you say fascinating things and this is my favorite topic so um thank you again for joining. Thank you for tuning in. Um, and here's to hoping that that 2021 brings um, lots of lots of good things for the beauty industry. Um, I'll tell you, I'll talk to you guys later. And thanks so much for tuning in. Bye, everyone. Thank thanks you for that. having me. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.